Welcome back to First Mover with Brad Cowan and myself. So we're going to dive right into um, our next panel on DeFi derivatives. This is an area that anyone looking at crypto should should know more about. Um, it's probably you know a little bit more more obscure uh, area, but uh, uh, such a fascinating one. And so we will do our, our best to cut through all the intricacies of, of this area and and um, and talk about what really matters. So we have a couple of the brightest minds in this space to to explain this uh, to us and everything that you know all the innovation that's going on in this space. So uh, we have Subin Kotica, he's CEO and co-founder of Open, a decentralized options trading platform. We also have Hart Lamber, he's co-founder of UMA, an open source protocol for issuing and trading synthetic assets. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much. Thanks, Cami. Yeah. Cami, mm -hmm. if, if I can take the first question here, I'd like to know, Zubin, decentralized finance, what does that mean in your words? Oh, that's such a great question. I think there's so much depth to that question because it's almost like we have three different things in, in the crypto world right now. We have DeFi, CeFi, and then traditional finance. And what all these things mean is still being worked out. To me, I think DeFi as it stands right now is a system where, um, where financial transactions are being done on a blockchain through a smart contract level. Uh, does that change with time? Potentially. I think there's uh, a lot of open questions, but I think right now that's what uh, the reality of DeFi is. Uh, what's interesting is a lot of DeFi is not 100% decentralized, and I think that's um, something that's true of like you know some of the most loved protocols. Uh, but I think that 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 being on chain in a smart contracting system is to me a large part of being DeFi. Okay, and Hart, uh, now now to you. Um, I'm wondering, you know, just connecting DeFi with the current environment. So, what in what ways do you think people can leverage DeFi in a financial crisis that that we're entering? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, Cami, you referred to this earlier, just when you were talking about the happening of just. Um, uh, the whole concept of not trusting anybody in this financial world, like self-custody, having your own assets, all those things. Um, maybe it's worth just diving into derivatives. Derivatives are this scary word that we all kind of don't understand. But, you know, when you think about it, financial derivatives in the traditional world are just contracts. They're legal contracts mainly that are enforced through the court system. What DeFi is doing here is taking legal contracts turning them into smart contracts and enforcing them with the blockchain, with the Ethereum virtual machine and with economic incentives. What's so cool about this is we're removing the need to trust the legal system or to trust some third party. And we're just li relying on the concepts of economics to kind of guide our, our decisions and to keep this thing robust. And so to kind of answer your question, what I think the importance of DeFi here is, is just removes the trust from anybody in being able to do any of these financial transactions. And Hart, that's important. Yeah. Go ahead. Go, go, well, Hart, I was just going to say, you know, some of the, again, some of the DeFi stuff can get compli complicated real fast. And now we're talking about derivatives, which are pretty complicated just to start off with. But, you know, can you tell us, Uma, what, it, what it, like in as simple terms as possible, what does Uma do? What we're trying to do, so what we do right now is we make it easy for people to create synthetic tokens. So using the Ethereum ERC-20 standard, you can create a crypto token that effectively tracks anything with a price fee. So this is what we're calling a synthetic asset. Um, and depending on how you look at it, you could, it could include a derivative under the surface, but that doesn't really matter. Um, and this synthetic asset um, is just now a tradable token that get, has all the benefits that crypto offers. So the programmability and the composability and the money Legos aspect. So concretely, Brad, you can create a token that tracks the price of gold, say. Um, where we're looking to go though, is extending this concept so you can create all types of financial products using this infrastructure to create um, derivatives or related financial products on an Ethereum blockchain without the need for any legal recourse or without the need to ever go sue anybody. 
And what gets really important or, or kind of really cool about this is it's permissionless and then globally accessible. So you end up taking a, a, a function, let's just call it derivatives, this crazy complex thing that traditionally is only accessible to like hedge funds in New York. And you make that innovation accessible with a way lower barrier uh, to entry to everyone globally. And so that is the really powerful concept, I think, behind DeFi that people get really excited about. Well, I'm, I'm curious, you know, we had in one of our earlier panels, we had Tim McCord from the CME, which is so heavily regulated and, and also Kraken Futures, which is regulated in the UK. Now, this system you're talking about is just totally unregulated. And you're talking about, you know, some of the, the legal enforceability of that. But is that actually like legally enforceable? I mean, how do you th how do you work all that stuff out? Well, ignoring like some of the regulatory issues and, you know, what should be allowed or not, like that's a societal question. Um, but if you just think technologically, why has, how, why has finance required so much legal recourse for say something like derivatives? It's because it was the only way you could build them. Um, and so in concept, in any derivative or at least complex transactions, you need to trust that that contract will get executed under the parameters that it's written. Um, and because you can't move money very quickly, the, the core reason why you need legal recourse is participants in these contracts can't move money back and forth very quickly at all. So you actually need a third party, in this case, the court system, to say, hey, you know, Brad, you didn't make good on this trade we did, and I'm going to sue you and take you to court. What is so fascinating about this blockchain thing is we can now move money so quickly programmatically that we can actually design a product technologically that does what those traditional derivatives do, but without requiring this legal system. I, I'm curious, but I, I mean, how do you know, I mean, just the, okay, the money moves, but can a court never undo those contracts? I mean, depending, again, how you write this, but now we could write smart contracts on the blockchain that are undoable, um, and they're enforced only by this logic of the system, the economic incentives. They're not enforced under, you know, the laws of the state of Delaware or whatever it might be. Um, and so it's a different way of doing things that I think, you know, this is, again, getting very abstract, but why I think the DeFi space gets so excited um, or people are realizing, like Cammy said earlier, this is a parallel financial um, system where you don't have to trust a court or, uh, or, 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 or like a judicial system that's going to enforce a contract the way it thinks it should be enforced. You instead get to trust this other system, which has its own flaws and like imperfections, but you get to trust this other system that's a smart contract platform and economic incentives and this, uh, this mechanism design behind the economic incentives to to enforce these contracts yeah it, it's it's um it's really like a really cypherpunk way of of doing finance it's a uh, code uh having complete control of transactions and cutting out every intermediary possible um so uh Steven, i i you know i want to talk about open and um and how uh, users are, are are using your platform to hedge against eth volatility so, um, you know, we're here talking to a broader audience who, you know, most of them might be more familiar with centralized exchanges, right? So why, why would someone want to use um, a decentralized platform to hedge against crypto volatility uh, someplace like Open? That's a great question. I think like Hart talked about this earlier, right? I think it's a lot of these tools were only previously accessible by a handful of users, right? Uh, and when I say a handful of users, uh, the way we think about users uh, in, in DeFi is very different than the way traditional finance thinks about users from a regulatory uh, and logistical point of view. It's really large institutions uh, that are well capitalized, that have, uh, that are accredited investors that have to sign ISDAs and have like a legal team to be able to look over uh, a, a, you know, a set of actually legally enforceable contracts. You can turn all those things that I just said into a single button click on on chain, and that's like pretty crazy. Um, is just how you can reduce the complexity of some of these, uh, you know, admittedly com complex instruments. 
Uh, so how does open work, right? Open it allows users to basically manage their risk that they face in DeFi. Um, and the way it does this is by uh, through derivatives, a special class of derivatives called options contracts. Um, and these options contracts uh, allow you, for example, let's take ETH, right? ETH is right now trading at 180 something, I believe, uh, last I checked. And I might fear that ETH is going to go to 150 or below. Uh, an option contract would give me the right at any time to exchange ETH for 150 USDC, for example, right? And so no matter what the price of ETH like goes and drops to, it can drop to zero, right? Uh, unlikely, but it could drop to an arbitrarily low number. I still have the right to 150 USDC for my ETH. And so I basically put a price floor. Uh, and that protects me, buying options protects me against ETH volatility in a very real way. Um, now, I think there's a lot of interesting moral questions that come up, right? Uh, I think we were all kind of talking about this. The CME and traditional uh, options exchanges are highly regulated. Um, and there's a whole kind of legal and, and ethical set of questions that have come um, when you have like these complex financial instruments uh, you're talking about. But I think like the fundamental question is that in traditional finance, if you're not, I, I think it lowers the barrier to understanding these options considerably, right? It, having having DeFi, uh, because code is 100% open source. Uh, you can pretty much understand how these things are working um, in, in a very kind of high fidelity way that you couldn't in the traditional financial system. And I think that's one set of moral questions that that's very interesting when you talk about uh, DeFi. Um, yeah. So, well, I, yeah. So, uh, go ahead. Zip. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, no. So, uh, yeah, moral, because you're, you're saying, you know, all, all investors should have access to, to that sort of protection, right? I think that's like a cypherpunk way to look at it, right? Uh, I think that everyone should have access to things that could like protect them. Right. I, I think that's mm -hmm. quite that makes sense, provided that, you know, it's displayed in a honest and forthcoming way that's understandable. And the great thing about DeFi is when when code is open source, it lowers the barrier to these things being understandable considerably. Um, at the same time, there are also questions about, you know, derivatives and traditional finance be playing a large part in in prior crises. And so that's like a very interesting set of questions. I think uh, to a large part, the reason why derivatives have, you know, kind of uh, have this stigma around them in traditional finance as, as being connected to crises is just because until DeFi, there was never, or it is impossible to make really exotic instruments or to make complex derivatives understandable to a lay person. And I think Again, it's not like DeFi is this panacea that immediately makes it perfectly understandable, but I think you lower the barriers considerably. And when you do that, you can have a world where people understand the financial risks that they're exposed to in a much uh, clearer way. Hart, uh, we, we're running out of time here. We've just got about 30 seconds, and this is a big question. But you know, we have all these open source projects and it seems like everything in DeFi is kind of in beta, but live. Like, what's that like for you as a project developer to put, the, you know, to be doing this and, and have it not really be tested, but it is live? Uh, that is a big question, Brad. I mean, listen, um, everyone in the space needs to be really careful and really actually frame things like if they aren't, if there are still things to be figured out, that needs to be made clear to the public or the people using it. Um, at the same time, the experiment's got to be run. So I think this is delicate balance here where you really want to have a community of people. And I think the DeFi community is generally doing a pretty good job on this, where they um, take risks seriously. They, they check each other. They push hard for um, good quality code, good quality thinking, and good communication. Um, and again, it's super early, so we just hope that this system evolves and gets um, more robust um, because, yeah, it is scary as a project doing things that are not, um, that have a big unknown component to them. Um, 
Okay, so I think I think we have to wrap it up, but this has been so interesting. Um, and yeah, I just want to give you a big thanks to Hart and Subin for, for joining us here tonight. Thanks so much for having us. This has been really fun. Yeah, thanks, Cami. Thanks, Brad. It's great. Thank you. Thank you both. All right. Stay healthy, everyone.